My name is Jason Buffington. I'm the Senior Analyst for Data Protection at the Enterprise Strategy Group. Today I want to take a few minutes and talk to you about the differences between regulatory compliance and operational readiness. When we look at the top 10 IT priorities for 2013 based on ESG's Spending Intentions Report, you'll see that improving data backup and recovery shows up as the number two planned IT priority trend for 2013. If you look on the bottom of the chart, you'll also notice that improving disaster recovery and business continuity, as well as improving regulatory compliance, both of them also separately show up on the list um, in the number nine and number 10 tied spots. In fact, if you were to look at the 2012, last year, the business initiatives with the greatest impact on IT spending, you'd again see things around improving business process, improving regulatory compliance, as well as disaster recovery again. When we look last year at what were the top 10 areas of data protection investments, again, you see improving business continuity and disaster recovery as the top item for last year, as well as um, managing uh, regulatory compliance coming in right behind it in the number two slot. Now, the reason that you keep seeing these separately is because they're different. They really are separate kinds of initiatives, and it's one of the things we want to talk about today. Specifically, we're going to talk about what is the difference between regulatory compliance and operational readiness. I'm going to try to explain the fact that the regulations are not as hard as most people presume, as well as the regulations are not as easy as they should be. Imagine a conversation between two gentlemen. Blue guy comes in, he's really, really happy. We just passed our regulatory audit. That's great. Green guy's response? Yeah, but the servers are still going down. We're not meeting our service level agreements. That's a difference between the audit saying oh, everything's good and the IT guy saying, yeah, but the servers aren't running. You could also turn that conversation around where the green guy says, hey, our service level agreements have never been better. That's awesome. And the blue guy saying, yeah, but we couldn't prove it, uh, which means that we got fined. Look, there's a gap between what people think of as regulatory compliance, meaning are we passing all the rules that are written down, versus operational readiness, meaning do we really know that all of our servers are holding data as long as they're supposed to, can be recovered as fast as they need to, et cetera. It's the difference between a checklist, which is what you get from regulatory compliance, versus an IT schematic, which is what you get from operational readiness. But whatever your overall data protection strategy is, it has to cover both sets of initiatives. How do I get all those green check boxes? And how do I make sure the stuff really will come back when I need it to? To give you an idea of how complicated some of these things are, I picked just a few regulations that a lot of people are familiar with. One of them is HIPAA, the Health Information Portability and Accountability Act. And the thing that's important to note here is, is that it's about the data being portable. It's about the data being accountable, meaning that only the right people are supposed to have it. And oh, by the way, it's supposed to be easily shareable between your healthcare providers and your insurers and the individuals themselves. So if you dig really deep into it, in section 2.3 of HIPAA, there is a rule called 164.308, and underneath that, subsection A, and then underneath that is section 7, talks about the mandates of establishing and implementing a contingency plan for fire and system failures and natural disasters. And in fact, it actually breaks down into five other kinds of prescriptive guidance for the IT manager around what is your data backup plan? What is your disaster recovery plan? And do you have emergency preparations? And how often should you test it, et cetera? So if you dig really, really deep, you can find, okay, now here's some guidance, but it's still not going to tell you what technologies to use. It's just going to give you some general mandates of what you need to pass those green check boxes. Then it's up to you to figure out what technologies you're going to use to map that back. If you're a publicly traded company, you're liable for Sarbanes-Oxley, and in Sarbanes-Oxley, you won't find a whole lot of words like backup or disaster recovery. You will find a lot of information around the sound business practice of retaining data. Uh, now, originally, when those mandates were coming in, it was actually paper data, but electronic data has the same legal weight, and therefore, when it talks about Sarbanes-Oxley, it's about are you retaining data for the sound business purpose of what you need to hold on to? Um, the idea of disaster recovery and data protection actually doesn't come until much later in, in the text. If you are a federal institution, or if you're a state agency, or if you are a private agency that actually works with federal, you can dig through several continuous operation or COOP mandates. One of the ones which is probably more pragmatic than most is from the Department of Homeland Security, Directive 20, or HSPD 20. And if you go to Section 11 of Part 20, you'll find there really is a guidance policy specifically on data backup. It's in Section 11, Part C, as well as rapid restoration or the requirements of resuming that resource, and that's Part 11, Subsection D. You could dig down a little further in Section 16, and you'll find things around disaster recovery and, and who's supposed to own what, and oh, by the way, how you can actually get the government to possibly pay for part of it. 
Other regulations that you'll find specifically around COOP actually start with the Department of Defense, but then later all the executive branch took it on, and again, state agencies that worked with them, private sector companies that worked with them as well, all kind of came under fold uh, eventually. But DOD 5015.2 STD talked about retention of data, including mandates around um, data protection and rollback and recovery and insured uptime, et cetera. And if you really want to dig into it, it's Section C, Part 2, Subpart 2, Subpart 9. Um, so dig into that if you really want, or check out my blog, technicaloptimist.com. I'll be digging into several of these regulations and trying to unpack them for you. There's some folks out there that think, I can solve all my problems if I just go to the cloud. And I have to tell you, as much as I'm a fan of cloud as part of a data protection strategy, you need to understand that most cloud services in general don't have the retention capabilities that will let you pass an audit all on their own you're still going to need to plan for how does that long-term retention, including assured deletion, happen, which in many cases still means you might still be using tape. Um, now, if you're not planning on using uh, tape cartridges, chances are your MSP is if they're going to actually sell you seven years, 10 years, 20 years of retention. And that also means, by the way, those tapes are going to need to have some level of assured survivability. Um, and in many cases, that means also an offsite vault as well. So don't just think just because you start cutting a check to a cloud provider that you've solved the problem. The main thing I want you to take away today is the regulations aren't as specific as you might think, but they're not as complicated as some presume them to be either, as long as you just spend the time and dig into them. When you look at your overall data protection plan, your plan needs to include not only how to pass those compliance aspects, but also what do you technically need to do within the specifics of your environment to actually ensure that you can recover across your physical, and virtual, and cloud layers of your infrastructure. My name is Jason Buffington with the Enterprise Strategy Group. Thanks for watching.